for being here. And uh, let's get a round of applause for yourselves for coming out on a freezing cold night. You're a very hearty bunch. And also, uh, hello to those who are watching online who are maybe smarter than they are hearty. I uh, hope, they're, hope they're well and warm and, and enjoying the online stream. And uh, some more thanks to the organizers, to Carla and the Lakeview Executive. They put in a ton of work, and it's always great to see an event. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Applauding is also good for your circulation. It'll warm you up as well. So feel free to applaud any time you want. But it's always great when we come to an event and we see the organizers having to haul out more chairs and, and not enough chairs, so it's great to see that. We had this same discussion a week ago in Saskatoon, and you know, I think here are three or four more people. We'll give you the win on this one. Uh, but, but it was a great discussion there and great turnout. Yes, go Regina. Renew Regina. And, uh, you know, we're here to talk about Renew Saskatchewan, which is our exciting plan to literally bring power to the people. I want to point out a couple of other folks who are here in the room who we haven't recognized yet. Mr. Trent Weatherspoon, the MLA for Regina Rosemont. And uh, fittingly, our, our environment critic is here today, Mr. Jens Peterson from Regina Rosemont. And I also see a number of other faces of people who've uh, put their names forward seek nominations, and uh, I, I won't go through naming everybody, but I'm glad that you've done so, and, and those of you who are thinking about seeking nominations and haven't yet, and those of you who Trent and, and Carla and Jens and I haven't harassed enough yet to seek nominations but are thinking about it, uh, we're excited about the team that's coming together for 2020. There's a, there's a lot of great people who are looking to be part of a team that can Renew Saskatchewan. And I, I want to thank the people who came and shared their stories tonight. Shannon and Josh and, and Carla shared her story, and Lucy and Jared and Stephen. Stephen, it was great. We got to tour Stephen's installment today, installation today, see the panels and see the see the meters and see him beam with pride over the uh, electricity being produced out of his house. Uh, it's so exciting to hear what motivates people, their why, what it is that drives them, and the steps that they've taken in response to that inspiration, to that motivation. Because that is where we will connect with people. It, we're going to talk a little bit about details, and I'll answer questions, but the, the how comes later. It's what connects us in a, in a shared vision of the kind of province we want to be that will make the change. And that comes down to stories. And when I think about climate change, I don't really think about one to two degrees Celsius. I don't think about crashing uh, sea ice or, or stranded polar bears, as much as those, all of those things are very important. Uh, my mind immediately goes to the soccer center in Saskatoon filled with cots, and to the emergency room in Royal University Hospital, uh, a place I've been with my own kid and I've been practicing medicine as well uh, as, as uh, Mali as a pediatrician. And I think about uh, I think about a mother sitting there looking at her seven-year-old son who is choking and struggling to breathe, and doing so because the air outside is full of smoke, and they're down from a northern community. They're down from Sandy Bay having to stay in the soccer center because of enormous forest fires, which are directly connected to climate change. And how, you know, in that moment, that child struggling for air, that mom's worry over the future of, of that child's health in the immediate future, and, and what, what's going on means for the rest of that kid's life, to me, symbolizes what it is we're all really thinking about, and brings it down to a level of beyond you know, what can be so hard to understand, so big, to the level of a single person. And I think about the stories 
that were shared with me. Like Jared said today, the stories of farmers across the province who say, oh yeah, climate change is real. It's happening right here on my land. Uh, our growing seasons are longer, our dry years are drier and more frequent, our wet years are wetter. Things are changing and I'm worried about how we're gonna farm this land given the change that's happened. And we're not getting the help to even think about what that will look like. Stories like these, I think, are really important for us to, to be able to understand the human impact of what can sometimes be, when we think about things like 12 years left before catastrophic climate change, or the World Health Organization calling this the biggest challenge to human health in our century. It can be so overwhelming and large, and how important it is to bring it down beyond what can be too big, too scary, that it actually ends up demotivating us and not getting us to take action. When you're talking about the numbers of billions of dollars that will be paid out in insurance claims, somehow that's much less powerful than thinking about a family sifting through their belongings after a flood or a fire, trying to salvage some of, what, of their precious uh, belongings, what mattered most in their lives. But even these stories, as much as I think they humanize uh, what it is we're really dealing with, they're stories of the harm. And that can motivate some folks. Fear can motivate some of us. I think we're more motivated and perhaps better motivated, motivated in a better direction by hope. And that's the type of stories that I want to work with you to bring forward. The stories that bring us hope and that bring this home to our everyday lives. And maybe one, one example of how that can happen. Who here recycles? Okay, very good. Trent, I was checking to make sure I saw you chuck a can out of the truck window one day. <laughs> Actually, no, I'm so excited to be here with all of you. Let's, uh, let's do that one more time. Who here recycles? Yeah, everybody's positive. <laughs> you look good with your hands up. You're, you're excited about what's going on. And, uh, you know, when, when did recycling happen? When I was a kid, uh, you know, our approach to recycling was burning, a, burning in a tin in a big can uh, in the farmyard. That was, uh, that was what we did with garbage, because there was no garbage collection. Uh, most of us can remember a time when everything went into the garbage. And then maybe there were a few, like, keen early adopters who were trying hard to, at the very least, reuse things and work together for a small recycling project. And then, over time, the early adopters, the oddballs, become the advocates. And they work with their cities and, and with their communities to build the critical mass that you actually get systemic change. And what was once on the margins becomes the norm. It becomes expected to the point that now, if trend tucks a cat out of the window, we're all going to give them a really hard time, right? Because that, that just wouldn't be the way we do things. He's a very responsible recycler. Um, right now, we have an opportunity to see a similar change. Saskatchewan people want to be part of a transition to renewable energy. A study, uh, I think I saw one of the authors here, but a, a study showed that 80% of the people in the province we're keen on seeing a transition to renewable energy. There's a, a desire to do this. There's also a great opportunity, as we heard from the kids from Jared's class. We have so much sunlight, and that doesn't even touch on how much wind there is, which we've been feeling the last few days, and biomass and geothermal and all of the other opportunities that exist for us to be leaders in renewable energy instead of the laggards that we've been as a province so far. But what's in the way? Why haven't we done it? It's all right there. Uh, Stephen showed us that the economics are there. But it isn't easy for everybody to say, I'm going to put down a few thousand dollars and make this risk. The cost barrier, whether it's for an individual family or a business, a farm, uh, a small community, is so often too much for them, to, even though they know they'd pay it off, that they'd save money in the long run. That initial output is just too much. And that's where Renew Saskatchewan comes in. Renew Saskatchewan is built on an idea that 
is not new to this province. Uh, when people ask Tommy Douglas after his political career, what was it he most proud of? M most of us might think Medicare, but it was actually rural electrification, bringing power to the people all over the province. And the way that that was done was that when a line was hooked up to your farm, you paid it off with the power bill that you were now getting because there was electricity coming to your farm. You paid it off over time. There was another program called the Family Farm Improvement Branch in the 70s that maybe fewer people would be aware of, but similarly impactful where someone would come up to the farm and say, okay, here's what's going on with your water, your sewer, and we'll help you with either at-cost materials or a low price to move from outhouses to indoor plumbing, move from well water to, to clean drinking water, and similarly paid off over time. So it's a model that we've seen work before, and that's what we're going to do with Reduce Saskatchewan. Someone would come up to your home, your farm, your business, your reserve, your town, and say, here's the, here's the opportunity for you. Here's what we